Let us pray. Holy God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, illumine these words that are read and proclaimed. Silence in us any voice but your own. May we hear with joy what you have for us this day. Amen. I don't know about you, but I wonder how the disciples might remember this day from our text. A few years after Jesus' death and resurrection, maybe when the disciples are there all together around the campfire sharing good stories, what would they say? What would they remember about this day? Maybe they're talking about the good old days, laughing, teasing, reminiscing the way good friends do after they share a life-changing experience. One of them looks over to Peter and says, hey, Satan, tell us about the day you rebuked Jesus. Remember that day? Another responds, yeah, how'd that work out for you? Another. What were you thinking, Peter? Well, Peter responds, you know, I just didn't like the way where he was going with that. When I signed up to fish for women and men, this is not what I had in mind. Great suffering, rejection, death. That's not what I signed up for. That's not who I thought the Messiah would be. Plus, even if he was thinking it, did he actually have to say it out loud? <laughs> well, the others got quiet, reflecting on that day, boy, like it was yesterday. I wonder what Peter actually said to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, you know what you said there in front of everyone? Your message was a little strong. <laughs> I'm going to have to disagree with you on that suffering thing you just talked about. You know, Jesus, that message is just not going to fly. It's like Peter is a campaign manager. Peter pulls Jesus aside out of line before he says something that he'll regret even more. You know, Jesus, you may want to soften your tone a little and not repeat what you said right there. Peter wasn't saying anything that the others weren't thinking to. Jesus' message cuts really deep, right to the core. Jesus has a very different understanding of discipleship than what most of them probably wanted. And when Jesus' reality and vision begins to conflict with what the disciples are thinking and take over their own, maybe our own, what do uh, we do what Peter did? We rebuke. We take someone's aside to enlighten her, to help her understand, to show him the error of his ways. That's all Peter did, right? If we're really honest, haven't we at some point disagreed with what Jesus has said, asking why he doesn't understand what we want or do what we want? Why won't he see the world our way? It all seems so very clear to us. For instance, if he can cast out demons and silence a man in the synagogue, surely he can silence the voices that drive us crazy. He can heal Peter's mother-in-law. Why can't he heal those we love? If he can calm the sea, surely he can calm the storms of our own world, and boy, don't we have lots of them raging right now. If he can feed 5,000 with a few fish and two pieces of bread, why does so much of the world go to bed hungry? Well, those are our rebukes, right? Have you asked those questions or similar questions recently? When Jesus does not act the way we want, we rebuke. And rebuke seems appropriate when you're hearing something you don't want to hear. Perhaps you've never, something that you've never heard, and likely you never want to hear again. Rebuke is perhaps necessary when you have not been adequately prepared for that which is to come. Rebuke is perhaps necessary when you have 
um, when you only face the impossible and when you face the incomprehensible, you rebuke. Just a few verses before today's gospel reading, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Well, Peter's response is really his public confession. You are the Christ, the Messiah. Peter's confession helps set up the things that happen in today's text. Jesus is the one for whom the prophet spoke the one for whom Israel has waited, the one who is supposed to restore God's people. Peter is right, and yet he also just doesn't understand. In our text, Jesus begins to teach all that will happen to him. And after Peter's rebuke, what does Jesus do? Steps right in and rebukes him right back in public. Jesus says, there is no softer way for me to say what is to come. Sometimes Jesus' words challenge us, even shock us. And so maybe we're not all that different than Peter. Jesus, in this text, I think invites people to engage in something bigger than themselves. To take on the powers of empire and define oneself in the name of Christ. That's discipleship. A life following Jesus may, the, may be the best way. This life may be hard and full of uncomfortable moments, but this way, the way of Jesus, will lead to resurrection and will lead to new life. Well, Jesus' words are hard and his way, extreme. Surely God didn't covenant with God's people to bring them out of Egypt into the promised land only to say, now let all that go. The Messiah is supposed to offer security and protection and put Israel back on top. Peter is learning that faith in Jesus is not all about the elimination of risk or the preservation of life and the ability to control Jesus, just as Jesus asked his disciples to risk it all, so too is he asking this of us, to risk, to abandon the ways that lead to separation from God, to relinquish control. That's what Jesus is doing, and he's inviting those who follow him to do nothing less. So how's your Lenten journey coming? I'm struggling with at least three of the three points that I just mentioned, risking, separating from God, and relinquishing control. In recent weeks, through the various images of our divisive climate, in a community that struggles to trust people in perceived authority, I've been thinking a lot about integrity. We've seen recent examples of leaders who make different decisions than we might and make us question integrity. What does integrity look like right now in the midst of a pandemic? What does it mean to lead with integrity right now? And how are people checking themselves on that? Well, that's complicated. And in this time of pandemic, people are finding their ways. People inevitably make decisions about a mutually shared interest or something that is based on self-preservation. Families are making decisions about what is best. Schools are weighing the science and the emotional toll of children and families and trying to figure it all out. It's complicated. Churches are making difficult decisions about is what is best for a worshiping community now and in the future. It's incredibly complicated. But it's Jesus who invites us into something bigger than ourselves. Jesus is reminding us that our whole life belongs to God. That we are not in control. God is. 
Thanks be to God for that. That our life is not about us. And that there is great freedom in knowing that at the end of the day, the role of savior of the world has already been cast. Praise God. Jesus is pointing the disciples and us to the larger story of God's work in the world. Along the way, we can see how Jesus chose to give in a world that takes, to love in a world that hates, to heal in a world that injures, to give in a world that kills. He offers mercy when others seek vengeance, forgiveness when others condemn, and compassion when others are indifferent. He trusts God's abundance when others say there is not enough. With each choice, Jesus denies himself and shows us that God is present. At some point, those kind of choices will catch the attention of the authorities, catch the attention of though and attention of and offend those who live and profit by power and control. And those choices will lead to betrayal and arrest and crucifixion and death. And where are we on part of that story? The late Rachel Held Evans offers what I think a most hope, uh, hopeful and inspired answer about a conviction that our lives find their meaning in the biggest stories we can imagine. To me, it speaks about integrity. She says this, quote, if the biggest story we can imagine is about God's loving and redemptive work in the world, then our lives will be shaped by that epic. If the biggest story is something else, like nationalism or follow your bliss, or he who dies with the most toys wins, then our lives will be shaped by those narratives instead." Unquote. God's loving and rede redemptive work in the world rests in the disciples and it rests in us. As we take our place among the most wonderful and mysterious and important story we can ever imagine. And as we walk into those stories this Lenten season, may we uncover again the pattern of our lives that lead us back to love. And if we follow that amazing story wherever it goes, and our story together, we might leave this place as witnesses and instruments of God's love. And we will do it all for love's sake. Thanks be to God.